you see three words that are integral to this unit. But they are words that you may not know. Set, element, relation. You all know what a set is because you have all in English class done that thing where you make a Venn diagram. And this is the characteristics of Romeo. And these are the characteristics of Juliet. And you list Romeos here and you list Juliet's there. And then anytime they share a characteristic, it goes into the middle box. And then a fun teacher sometimes throws, oh, I don't know, maybe Friar Lawrence in there. Right. And then, whoo, doggy, are you in big trouble? Because yeah. Friar Lawrence has a lot in common with Romeo and a lot in common with Juliet. But not much with both of them, because that Friar Lawrence is a moron, because he's the reason everybody's dead. Spoiler yeah. alert, sorry. <laughs> but since the very first lesson in all Shakespeare is that Shakespeare's plays are either tragedies or comedies, and he tell, the, your teacher tells you that tragedies mean everybody dies, you got a 50-50 shot that everybody's going to die right. in every play you read. Anyways, let's do math. So, a set. You all know what it is in English class. It's one of those circles of the Venn diagram. In math class, a set is... Anything you can count. It is data. Or data, depending on what you say. Any piece of information is a set in math class, okay? Can you have a set with one thing in it? Yes, because one piece of information is a set. Everybody cool? Ease, bees, lemon, squeezy, yeah? So if I were to say there are 30 teenagers in this room, is that a set? Yes, excellent. There is one adult in this room. Is that a set? Yes. Everybody cool? Ease, bees, lemon, squeezy. Element. Any single... Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Any single piece of info. Elements are datums. Data is the plural of datum. Sets are data. They are made up of single pieces of information which are datum, all right? So the set of teenagers in this room, Jess is an element of that set, okay? Everybody understand? Ease, bees, lemon, squeezy, yes? Everybody's cool? All right. We're going to move along then. A relation is... Any time one set is compared to another set. Okay? Anytime you take one set, you compare it to another set, you have a relation in math class. Everybody cool? Everybody cool? All of you make up one set, yes? Right? All of you are a set in this room, yes? All of you have a weight, yes? Is your weight data about you? Yes. Can I compare you, the kid, with you, your weight? Yes. So I have a relation. Everybody good? All right. Now let's put this into picture form. Here I have a graph. On that graph, it is showing data visually, yes? Okay. What are the two sets shown on this graph? Set one, types of dog. Excellent. What is set two? Heights of dog. Everybody agree? And we can quite plainly see we are comparing them, yes? The hound is how tall? 
60 what? Exactly. This is a bad graph. I'm taking a moment to use this graph to show us stuff. What is wrong with this side? There's no units. And what else is wrong with this side? There's no title. Height, centimeters. What's wrong with this one? What's wrong with this? No title again. Is there a unit that I could put there? No. Everybody good? Everybody can read this graph, right? How tall is a corgi? Excellent. How tall is a chihuahua? I only put that on there because to show that I'm not doggist, even though chihuahuas have no place being on a list with any of those other dogs. Because the rest of those dogs are dogs. Chihuahuas don't deserve to live. But that's beside the point. If any of you have a chihuahua, I'm sorry for you. If any of you know a chihuahua, I too am sorry for you. My friend growing up, wait for it, this is a true story. My friend growing up had got a new dog. I asked, what kind of dog did you get on the phone? My friend Bobby replied, it's a chihuahua. And then he paused. Because even when I was 10 years old, I hated chihuahuas. And my good friend Bobby knew I hated chihuahuas. So he paused. And I was like, why, man? And he said, a chihuahua crossed with a Labrador. And I said, because even at 10, I understood biology. Bobby, how? And he said, it is artificially created. Now, all of you are aware of biology as well. You are aware that you can create these types of breeds. Luckily for Bobby, he ended up with a chihuahua-sized Labrador. Well, let's think about it for a moment. My dog that weighs 80 pounds is a Lab Shepherd cross. So, let's pretend that he got the other way around. He got an 80-pound Chihuahua. That would be awful. But luckily, he ended up with a dog that looked like a Labrador puppy that never got bigger. The perfect dog. Because everybody loves puppies. But then they turn into great, glumping, 90 pounds pieces of poop eaten stupidity. And that's what you get. No. Nor do I like Shih Tzus, nor do I like Min Pins, nor do I like anything that isn't taller than my knee. The thing I like about dogs that are shorter than my knee is they're easier to kick. And here is why, Hazel. Let's pretend, let's pretend my 80-pound dog behaved the way every little dog behaves. Barking like a maniac, biting, chasing you, attacking every chance it gets. If my 80-pound dog did that, how long before somebody would make me put it to sleep? A day. But little dogs can behave however they want. If I see one more old lady bending over my pile of green peppers in the store while their little dog in their purse <laughs> all over my vegetables, I will go ape. And what's their reason? He's only little, it's okay. But if I brought Cooper in, in a hockey bag, because he weighs 80 pounds, what would everyone say? No dogs allowed in the store. The world is doggest. Because little dogs get to whatever the hell they want. They even get their own space at the dog park. 
Yeah, that's true. Why? It's not because big dogs attack little dogs. It's because little dogs attack big dogs. And when a big dog says, if you bite me one more time, I'm going to eat you, and they do, which they should, then the big dog gets in trouble. Right? Yes. Huh? Again, if it's over the height of my knee, I will accept its existence. I do not accept the existence of whippets, though, because you can actually see through parts of their body. And you shouldn't be able to see through parts of a body. That's grody. Now, everybody likes puppies. Puppies don't count. All right. Is everybody cool? Now, of course, YouTube fans, of which I have none, I don't kick dogs, but I do despise little dogs. All right. Now, here is the next new word, function. Now, think back to grade five. Some of you will remember this drawing from your elementary school math textbook. They drew like a box with like this thing on the top that you could drop a number into. And then it had an arrow and a different shape. And in there it wrote like plus three. And then it had an arrow and a different shape. And then it said times two. Then it had an arrow and a different shape, and it had minus seven. Then it had an arrow, another shape, and then it spit out a new answer. Have any of you seen this before? You drop in a six, that's your input. Then you add three to get nine, then you multiply by two to get 18, then you subtract seven, and then you get your output, which is 11. If some of you have seen that, great. If some of you haven't, it's no big deal. But the reason I bring it up is because you've seen, some of you have seen this, and every year there's always a few that have seen it. Your textbook called it a function machine. And the whole point of it was you started with a number, you did a bunch of stuff, and then you got a new number. And no matter what number you dropped in here for input, you got a different number out here for an output. Right? Now, If I list like six numbers here, is that a set? Okay. If I drop six different numbers into my input of my function machine, how many outputs will I get? Six outputs. Will any of those outputs be the same? Will any of these six outputs be the same as each other? No, that's impossible, right? So if I were to compare my inputs with my outputs, every input would give me one output, yes? That is what a function is. A function is a special, and I'm capitalizing special for a reason, is a special type of relation whereby each input yields, and we all know what the word yield means, yes? Each input yields a unique output. Then, down at the bottom here, all functions are relations. But not all relations are functions. Is everybody cool? As soon as I have a function, I'm comparing two things. So it's automatically a relation. But just because you're comparing two things doesn't make it a function. We're about to do some examples here. Okay? So let us look at this first one. Each month of the year relates to a number of days. Everyone agrees that's two sets? What is set one? That's month. 
What are the elements of set one? What are the elements in set one? No. Yeah. January, February, March, April, and so on. Yes? Okay. What is set two? The number of days. What are the elements in that set? What are the number of days a month can have on our calendar? It can have 28. Twenty-nine, thirty, and thirty-one. Agreed? Okay. I am going to say an input. You tell me the output. Everybody okay? January. Thirty-one. Does January as an input yield me one output? Yes, it does, doesn't it? Okay. March. Does March yield me one output? But it is unique. March only has one output. March has 31 days. Everybody cool? April. 30. Now, February. No. 28 or 29. So, is this a function? This is a relation because the input of February yields how many outputs? Two, Two outputs. 28 and 29. Everybody understand? So it's a relation. It's not a function. It's a relation because I'm comparing one set, months, to another set, the numbers of days in the month. Everybody cool? All right, let's look at the second one. What is set one? What is set one? Okay, so we've said they are names. What are the elements of that set? Now, this is where it can get a little complicated. What are the elements of that set? The individual names, yes? First name, last name, or both? What do you care? Okay, we'll go first name. So, we're going to go F name, first names. Agreed? Okay. What is set two? It's the student. And what are the elements of that set? The actual kid, yes? Right? So, her. I can't say a name because she's an element of the set. The names are another set, yes? So there's kid A, kid B, kid C, kid D. Everybody with me? So, each student. Now, let's check the elements of first names. So we'll just use these four because they're over here. Anoop, Amneet, Toby, and Anoop. Right? How many Anoops are in this class? There, it's just one kid. She was kid A. How many Amneets? Kid B, how many Tobies? Kid C, how many Anus? Kid D, everybody agree? Everybody cool? If I input a name, can you find me that kid? Ken, where is he? Right over there. Easy peasy. One name, one kid, right? Is it a function? Think again. I'll input a name. Sahil. How many outputs are there? Which one am I thinking of? Which one? 
No, I can only think of one. An input has to have an output. Which one am I thinking of? Daniel, which one am I thinking of? Wrong. Maybe. Everybody understand? So in our class, by first name, is it a function? No, it's a relation. What if I went first names and last names? Then is that a function? I'll change color there. If I add last names, if I go firsty, lasty, is that a function? Yes or no? Yes. Then it's a function. Now, last year in grade 10, in this room, I had two Jazreet Dillons. Jazreet K. Dillons. Could I ever have gotten a function there? No. Because no. even all the way down to middle name, it would never work. Could I do it by last name? In this class, maybe. But in general, could I? No, because every class always has a few Gills or a few Smiths or a few whatevers, yes? Everybody understand? I bet Sebastian's never been in a class with another rat's laugh, though. Everybody cool? All right. Now, so let us talk about these four new words, too. Now, these words are in the wrong order. Independent should be at the top because it's easier to define. I'm going to highlight it yellow. What does the word independent mean in, in... Oh, wait. Before we go on, I got to make sure of something. Because everybody answers this question's, question wrong. What's a variable? Wow, we're all over the place. So Austin says something that varies. What does that mean? Pardon me? It changes. Okay. Ekam, what you say? Ekam said it's an X. What'd you say, Anu? Something that can change. Yeah, that's what it really is. A variable is anything that is changeable. Okay? We define what a variable looks like by using a letter. Everybody understand? X is not a variable. X is the symbol we use to show a variable. Everybody cool? So a variable is anything that can change. All right, good. So an independent variable. What does independent mean? What does independent mean? Are any of you independent? <laughs> That's funny. All right, I'll, I'll let you try to answer this again. Are any of you independent? No, of course not. Why? You live at home. Almost all of you, right? Always one, every so often I get a kid that says, I don't live at home. That's fine, okay. You got a job and you pay your rent? Well, no, then you're not independent. Everybody in here except who? You. Me is not independent, Right? Now, you can argue your independence all you want, but if the roof over your head and the food in your belly come from somebody else, you're not independent. End of discussion. Everybody cool? So we all know what the word independent means. So what must an independent variable be? We know a variable is something that changes. So what must an independent variable be? Something that... That's not what? I'm sorry. I, I, I understand what you're saying. Yes. There's nothing happening to it. It's just the one that's out there and it is. Everybody cool? So the independent variable, I like to define it as the variable that's the same. And it's weird to say a variable can be the same. That's the same all the time. So here's what I mean by this. Is your age variable? Yes, it changes. Agreed? But 
all of us in this room have an age, don't we? Everybody cool? Everybody see the link? We all have an age. So it's, the in, it's, it's a good example of an independent variable. Okay? All right? We all have fingers, yes? We all have the same amount of fingers, yes? But if I were to bring Mr. Wimmer up here, does he have the same amount of fingers as all of us? He's lost a bit of one. So the independent variable is fingers. The dependent variable, which is obviously the thing that depends, changes. Everybody cool? Even though they're both variables and they both change. Everybody understand? You're going to see this better in a moment. So the independent variable is a variable that's the same all the time for all of us. All right? Are we all spending time in this classroom? So would that time spent in this classroom, because it is changing, would that be an independent variable? Yes, because we're all sharing that time in this room. Yes? I'm talking, though you're listening, right? Everybody with me? Well, some of you are listening. Everybody's cool? All right. Now, I'm going to highlight the word domain because the word domain goes with the independent variable. The domain is the set of elements that make up the IV, I'm too lazy, independent variable, okay? The independent variable is the thing. The domain are the values of that thing. Does everybody understand? So in this room, if we say age is an independent variable, right? The element, the domain is, what is the, who's the youngest person in this room? Is there anybody in this room that is still 14? Shouldn't be. Yeah? Okay. One 14-year-old. Is there anybody in the room that's 15? A few hands go up. Is there anybody in the room that's 16? A few hands go up. Is there anybody in the room that's 17? Of course not. I am... Appalling. I am 44. So... What are what is the domain of uh, of the ages in this room? Fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, and forty-four. Does everybody understand? The independent variable is age. The domain are those values. Everybody cool? All right. Now you're intelligent young people. Our dependent variable is. The variable that changes with the changes to the IV. All right? Everybody understand? So, stick with age. If I input 14, my output is how many hands come up, yes? Who in this room is 14? Hands go up. Who in this room is 15? Hands go up. Who in this room is 16? Hands go up. Who in this room is 44? Hands go up, yeah. Everybody understand? The out, the dependent variable, the other thing that changes how many hands go up depends on the age I call out. Everybody with me? Right? If I don't give you that value, if I just say, I'm thinking of a number. Now, all of you that know that number, put your hand up. Everybody with me? You need an independent variable to get a dependent variable. Everybody cool? Now, being the intelligent young people that you are, if the domain is the set of elements that make up the IV, what's the range? C. 
So, in my example, if my, in, my independent variable is 14, what's my dependent variable? The number of hands that go up, right? If my independent variable is 15, the dependent variable is how many hands go up. Everybody cool? Now, there's some weird stuff about this. Does the box go on a new page for you people, or is it right with you? It's at the bottom of 170 whatever, right? 177? It does go on to 178? What a pain. Now, IV is usually, which means almost always, graphed on the x-axis. Which is which one? The horizontal one. DV is usually graphed on the y axis. Everybody cool? So if I were going to keep with our example, what are my options for independent variable? Age. I can be 14, fitting, 16, or 44. And over here is people. How many 14-year-olds? One. How many 15-year-olds? A bunch. How many 16-year-olds? A bunch. How many 44-year-olds? One. Everybody understand? All right, let's try to put this into perspective. My girl Sandy's getting a job at Flying Wedge Pete's. You can tell how old these notes are. There isn't even a Flying Wedge in Abbotsford anymore. But there used to be. You find yourself in Vancouver, you find yourself near a Flying Wedge Pete's. I don't even know if they still exist. If they do, it's delicious pizza. I highly recommend it. So Sandy's getting a job at Flying Wedge Pizza. She is paid $9.50 an hour. Her hours worked are related to her pay per week. Let's identify the independent and dependent variable. You talk amongst yourselves. Tell me what the IV is. Tell me what the DV is. But before you can do that, you have to decide on the two things that are variable here. What are the two things that are going to change? How is she work? The amount she gets paid. Great. So that's a good decision. Now, which is which? The, wait, the pay is the independent variable? And the, no, wait. No, the pay is the Talk amongst yourselves and figure it out. My angry bird is going to flap around my head a few times, and you're going to tell me the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the money will change with the hours. So the, the independent per, per hours. Who would like to give me an answer? You've had a bit of time to talk? Jordan, hit me. Pay depends on hours. So the DV would be pay and the IV would be hours. Everyone agree? And his definition was how much Sandy gets paid depends upon how many hours Sandy works. Are we happy with that? Absolutely, that is correct. If Sandy does not go to work, Flying Wedge is not going to give her a paycheck. Everybody understand? Do any of you work at Flying Wedge? Are hours still passing for you? There's another way to look at it. Everybody good? All right, now let's identify the domain and range. Which is the domain? The, in, the set of independent or the set of dependent? Independent. So my domain is this set. Now I'm going to put a restriction on this domain. Sandy can only work whole numbers of hours. And as with everywhere in British Columbia, she can only work a maximum of eight hours in a day. Everybody cool? So what is the domain of this relation? Talk amongst yourselves.
So we've established that the independent variable is the hours. What is the smallest amount of hours she can work? Zero. She didn't go to work that day. Then what? One. Then what? 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 That's a set, yes? Because I specifically told you she could not work partial hours. They don't schedule her for that. Once we have a set, there's a fancy way to write this out. I am not going to fill your brain up with that fancy way of writing it. You can learn that next year. Suffice to say, we put these squiggly brackets, the ones that back from the day were the devil horns on your old emojis before you guys got the wussy emojis that you just click on it, right? Back when you actually had to make up your emojis. Yes. I used to have one that was supposed to be me. It was greater than and less than because my hair parts in the middle. And then it was a number eight because I wear glasses. And then it was a dash for my nose. And then it was a bracket because I was so smiley all the time. That was me. Well, I know, but how do you draw it, really? Everybody cool? All right. Now. We put the squiggly brackets around it. Now, there's other stuff to write there, but I don't care about it. What then is the range? What's the lowest amount of money she could have made? Zero. Then what? 950. Then what? 19. Then what? 2850. And so on and so on and so on. I'm going to run out of room. Up to a total of 8 times 950 is 72, $76. Yes? Yes. Everybody cool? Everybody cool? All right. Now, which of these do you think is the input? The independent variable or the dependent variable? Hmm? Which of those would I consider to be the input? The hours, because that's what she puts into her job, yes? So if this is my input, this is my output, yes? So let's check. If I work zero hours, how many outputs are there? Zero. Well, one output. It's zero. If I work one hour, how many outputs are there? One output, 950. Two, 19. Three, 2850. So is it a function? Yes. Because each hour, each hour worked yields Unique pay. Everybody cool? Now, let's look at 4A. What form is that written in? X and Y. Now, I haven't told you what these are, so if I haven't told you what they are, which is the independent variable? X, which is also our input. So our domains are what? X values. What are our ranges? Y values. So my domain is what? One, then what? Two, then what? Then what? And what is my range? Three, six, nine, twelve. Now, one, three is what we call an ordered pair. They go together. 
Once we have split them up, they are no longer a pair. They are domains and ranges. Everybody with me? So let's check. How many outputs is there for one? One, because one is three. How many outputs for two? One, six. So is it a function? This is a function. Why? Because each input yields one output. Now, I don't want to say X and Y because what if we're not talking about X and Y? What if we have hours and days? Or, 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 or hours and pay? Everybody with me? That's why I want you thinking inputs and outputs. Everybody good? All right, let's look at the next one. What is my domain? One, zero, negative one. Now, look at that. Does that make sense writing it that way? Why not, Ekam? Because it doesn't. Yeah, that's not how we read numbers, is it? Right? So this is what we want to say because we read left to right. But in math, we write it in ascending order. So what's the lowest value there? Negative one, then zero, then one. Why don't I write zero twice? Because it's just a value. I'm only looking for the elements, right? Zero is a value in the domain. Doesn't matter how many times it shows up, it's there. So I only need to count it once. Cool? So knowing what you know now, what is the range? Negative one. Zero and one, correct? Now, if I write that range properly, which we did this time, I end up with negative one, zero, one, correct? Now, if you were to read these two, some of you might think that the point negative one, negative one exists on the graph. Does it? No, because once we have split into dependent and independent variable, we are no longer dealing with an ordered pair. Does everybody understand? All right, so now, is it a function or a relation? It's a relation. Why? Right. At input what? Zero. It yields how many outputs? When I input zero, I get one, but I also get Negative one. It yields two outputs. Is everybody with me? Everybody's good? All right. You try C. You know all the tricks now. You try C. I want to know the domain, the range, and whether or not it's a function, function or relation. What H? Oh, that says it. Sorry. It yields. So what's my domain? Two, four, six, eight. Who do we appreciate? Math, math. Ra, ra, ra. What's the range? Three, five, seven, nine. Three, five, seven, nine. Now, in this case, does two, three exist on the graph? Yes. It does. Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. Function or relation? Function. Why? Because each is one value. Right. Better, better, Each input... Yields one output. Now, what's different in D? It's actually on a graph. But every point on the graph is what? An ordered pair. So every point on the graph has an X and a Y, yes? So, again, what are my domains? 
where do I look for domains? Are they X's or Y's? X's. So right now, all I care about is the X axis, yes? Where do I find the lowest number? On the left or the right? On the left. Where is it? Negative 3. I'm not going to use circles because I got that on there. X. X. Where's the next one? Zero. Where's the next one? One. Where's the next one? Then then the next one? Three. So what's my domain? Negative three. Negative two. Zero. One, two, three. Agreed? Where do I look for range? On the y axis. Where do I start? Y. Because it's the lowest. So 1, y, 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 and y. And what do I find? Negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. Agreed? Function or relation? Y. It's a relation because at input of what? Inputs are my x's. Where's the problem? At input of negative 2, there's what? Two outputs. There and there. Everybody cool? When I go to negative 2, there's two possible dots I could be speaking of. Everyone's good? Does it happen anywhere else? No. When you turn the page over, you will see a big empty box that says vertical line test. We're going to flip back and forth between these two pages for a second. The vertical line test only works on graphs. And here's what it means. If a vertical line, what direction is vertical? Up and down. If a vertical line hits your graph more than once, It's a relation. Now, I left a bunch of white space there on purpose in a moment. When you get that written down, flip back to this graph where I will erase all the dots I have put on it and I will draw a vertical line. How many times did it hit? Once. Oh no, how many times did it hit? Twice. So it is a relation. I can only do that with graphs. Everybody cool? So now let's go back to all our white space there. Function or relation? Take my vertical line. How many times does it hit the black graph line ever? Once. So what is it? So this is a function. Now, let's go over here. Function. Function, 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 function. Oh, what happens there? Three times. At this x value, there's one, two, three possible outputs. So this is a relation. Is everybody good? Is everybody good? Okay. All right. So let's test. Is 5a a graph? So can I use the vertical line test? Sure I can. I'm going to go ahead and draw me a vertical line.
And let's test. Am I okay there? 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 No. There? There? No. There? There. So what is it? This is a relation. Why? Because at what inputs? Negative one and positive one. It yields multiple outputs. So next thing is domain and range. What's the domain? Where do I look for domain? X's. What's the furthest, the, the least X value? Negative 3. What's the next X value? Negative 2. What's the next X value? Negative 1. What's the next X value? 0. What's the next X value? 1, then, then, 3. So it's negative 3 all the way up to positive 3. Negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. Agreed? Okay, what's the range? Where do I look for the range? Only on the y values. So what's the smallest y value? Negative 2. What's next? Negative 1. What's next? 0. What's next? What's next? What's next? So it goes from negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. Now please notice... I have six range val domain values, five, six range values. Agreed? But I have significantly more than that in points on the graph. Yes? Right? How many points on the graph? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine points on the graph. But... Only six range, domain values and six range values because there's repeating. Everybody cool? Once I split up to domain and range, I do not care anymore that they are ordered pairs. Is everybody good? Okay. What's different on B? It's a line. Is it a graph? So can I check with the vertical line test? So if I bring my red vertical line down here, what's going to happen? How many times do I hit the blue line? Only once all the way along, yes? So this is definitely a function. Now, we got to get a little crazy here. The domain is the lowest x value. Yeah, who can find it? Negative 3. Everyone agrees, right? Now, when it's a dot, the next x value was here, yes? But this is not a dot. Is there an x value all the way along? There is, right? Does that x value continue? All the way along, doesn't it? So I'm not just putting dots on the x-axis, am I? I'm actually filling it all the way in up to there, yes? Because could I not use 1.2 and get an output? So does everybody see that difference? How many numbers exist between negative 3 and negative 2? Infinity. Would it be possible to write all of them? No. So we have a different way of writing this. We still put our lowest value first, which is what? Negative three. Now, see how that dot is colored in? That means I hit negative three. So negative three is less than or equal to X. What's my maximum? Positive 3, and it's colored in. So that means x is less than or equal to 3. And we write this is what we call set notation. Everybody cool? Now, what do you think we would do if it looked like this?
Oops, that's not supposed to be a white dot, you dummy head. What's different now? It's not colored in anymore, yes? That not colored in means I approach negative 3. Do I ever get there? No. So it would be negative 3 less than x or, and less than 3. Does everybody understand the difference? What if one of them was colored in? What would it be? Negative 3 less than x less than or equal to 3. Does everybody understand? Now, how lazy are math guys? Lazy, right? They don't like to write more numbers than they need to. So they also invented another way to write this. It looks like this. Square bracket, negative 3, comma, 3, square bracket. That is called interval notation. And that means... Negative 3 is included and positive 3 is included. What if it was that? Could I put a square bracket there? No, so we put a round bracket. Is everybody good? What? Yeah? So what if it was like this? It's like this one. I'm getting to that. Yeah. We've only done domain right now, right? I think so, yeah. Okay. Everybody cool with domain? All right. Let's do range. Where do I look for my range values? The y axis. What's my lowest y value? Negative 2. Is negative 2 included? Yes, because the dot is colored in. So what sign goes here? Less than or equal to. And what are we counting now? Y's or X's? Y's. And what does it go up to? Positive 3. Is positive 3 included? So what arrow goes here? The equals arrow. That's what you were asking. Right? Everybody cool? What would this be in interval notation? What kind of bracket? Square bracket, negative 2, comma, 3, square bracket, because it's all included. Now, where you guys make your mistakes is on things like this, which is what Ekam was just asking about. It's a peak, right? Some kids only color up to the end of the line. But you can see that there's Y values higher than that. Everybody cool? That's why I stressed, once we have split them into domain and range, we are not looking at individual points. Everybody good? Okay. Turn over to C. Damn, son. What? I haven't told you what to do yet. What do you think you will do for domain and range? Talk to your neighbor, see if you can figure it out. <laughs> Remember, what do I always do? I always say do what you know first, right? So what on this graph bothers you? It's broken up, right? But if this wasn't here, then do you know what to do? Do you know what to do? Sure. And then if this wasn't here, do you know what to do? Okay, do that, and then we'll talk.
If I'm only looking at that side, what's my domain? Negative 30 is absolutely right. Jess, what kind of arrow? Oh, no. Equal or regular? Why? Closed dot. Then what am I counting? What am I counting? X's or Y's? X's. And what does it go up to? Is negative 10 included? Look at the drawing. Is negative 10 included? It's a yes or no question. Is negative 10 included? Yes. Kyle, is negative 10 included? Yes. Henry? No, it's not. Why? Because the dot's clear, so what error do I put there? A regular one. Nice. Negative 10. How would I do that? In interval notation, square bracket, negative 30, round bracket. Excellent. Now, what happens? So that we've covered. What happens right here? Does it start up again? Okay, so what's my lowest domain there? Zero. Does it equal zero? What am I counting? X's. What does it go up to? Does it equal 30? No, because it's an open dot. How would I draw that in this notation? Square bracket. Zero. Round bracket. Done. Now. Because this is this one graph, but it has two different sets of domain, doesn't it? This is the first set. This is the second set. So because they are both unified on one graph, we put a big U between them. Because it's this set and this set. Does everybody understand? If they weren't together, there's a different symbol. But you're going to learn that later. I don't want to burn your brains out. Okay. What's the range now? You should all be able to do the range by yourself now. What's my lowest range? Negative 20. Is it included, Ken? Yep. Up to what? Up to what? Zero. And zero is not included. That's this part. What happens right here? It starts again, so I need a U. What's my lowest value there? Ten. Is ten included? No. So it's a regular arrow. Up to what? Is 30 included? Is 30 included? Yes. yes. How would I write that in interval form? Square bracket. Negative 20. Soft bracket. Yeah, some, some kid said that for the first time ever this year. I'd never heard it termed that way. Some kid in the first unit. So he must have had the same math 8 teacher as, or math 9 teacher as you guys. And what's this one? Soft bracket. 10, comma, 30, hard bracket. It was Zach. Yeah, Zach Goulet said soft and hard brackets. You ever been in a math class with Zach Goulet? Weird. Because he was the one that was soft and hard brackets. Is everybody cool? All right. Prove it. Do D. Not only do I want the domain, 
and range in both forms, I also would like for you to, to postulate whether it is a function or a relation. And that's all we're doing today, and I'm giving you no homework because you have a test tomorrow. What? The cumulative is... Oh, it could be this week if I so choose. I don't know yet. I cannot see the future. If I could see the future, I already would have picked Wednesday's lottery numbers, would win Wednesday, and then not be here Thursday, And because I, I couldn't care less when the cumulative is, because I just won a million dollars. Ah. All righty. Who's going to tell me the domain? He waited patiently. Hiya! It's tricky. Who's going to tell me the domain? Thirty of the best and brightest. You got eight minutes to figure it out. What's the domain? Negative six. Is it included, Miss Walton? No. So what arrow is it? A regular one. The alligator is hungry for the X. Then what? This is where it gets tricky. It goes to negative three, and then what? It starts again right away. So it continues till there, and then what happens? It starts again right away. Where does it end? I'll get to you in a sec. Where does it end? Is six included? So what kind of arrow? But an equals. And what would that look like in the interval notation? Soft, hard bracket, or round square, or parenthesis and bracket, if you want to get really technical. Now, Jesse, what is your question? It does, but the negative three is included right there. This line goes to negative two point nine 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 What's the range? What's the range? Three, six, nine. Why can't I use this for the range? Because there's no values except three, six, and nine. I look on the y-axis. There's three, there's six, there's nine. And that's it. Now, function or relation? It is a function. But, Austin, how can that be a vertical line through there? Because this one's not included. Because negative 3 only exists... with an output at positive 3. Is everybody good? All right. Now listen to me carefully. When you turn the page over, you will see two pages of graphs. All right? 
your job, and this is not until Wednesday, is to tell me the domain and range of each of these on page one. I want the domain and range in set notation. On page two, I want them in interval notation. Now, the photocopying is a little crappy. On page one, every dot is closed. Even that one that looks open. Even four. Every dot is closed. In number three, this arrow is going flat. Okay? In number six, five, the arrow is going flat again. Is that clear to everyone? Okay, turn the page over. Number two. This dot is open. This arrow is flat. This dot is open. Everybody cool? Everybody cool? And in four, five, and six, all of these dots that look open are open. And both those arrows are there. And in number five, which is the open one? The top one. When is this due? Wednesday. Should you look at it tonight? No, because you have a test tomorrow. When should you start this? Tomorrow. tomorrow. When? After, test. After your test. Is there a review score to report this time? No. no. And undoubtedly, this will be the time that all of you are writing numbers on the top. Because there isn't one to write this time.